Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you to Ilse for inviting me. Um, there's nothing worse than speaking after somebody like Vash, because she's such an incredible presenter. So <laughs> I'm afraid um, I'll do my best. Okay, so I'm going to speak about food consumption in the South African population. Um, and it's actually quite a difficult task, because they, aren't, they haven't been, uh, as has been mentioned earlier by Lucia, there's been very little done on a national scale or even on a provincial scale. So um, I'm just going to sort of take a few little studies and scratch around and try and give some trends of what's, what's actually happening. Okay, if I can just figure this one out. No. Yep. Okay, most of, important of all is that there hasn't been a national survey the only one that was the uh, National Food Consumption Survey in children uh, of one year to nine years old, which took place in uh, 1999. So it's actually already 16 years ago that this national survey uh, took place. And as you know, over time and urbanization, a whole lot of things that were mentioned by Vash, people's eating habits do change. So it's, it's difficult and I think uh, would be inaccurate of us to rely on data from uh, 1999. So the aim of um, the study that um, Lucia mentioned was for us to look at dietary surveys that have been done, was to look over the last 15 years and to see what is actually available. Um, and our team has actually looked at um, both adults um, and children, and we've made a few summaries on, on what our findings were. But um, there are limitations to this because different studies have used different methodologies. And, and sometimes the only study in a province was one where they used a um, completely different methodology. And hence, to compare that study with other studies makes it, makes it very difficult, actually, and quite, I would say, unscientific as well. So um, you have to see this in terms of trends um, and not in terms of actual to the gram kind of thing. Okay, what we did was we, we searched the literature and um, we looked at dietary studies done in South Africa from, from 2000 and in both adults and children and we only looked at healthy adults and children because there's quite a lot of literature on um, children who have TB or children who have HIV and the same with adults. Uh, so we decided that we were going to exclude those studies and only look at healthy children and healthy adults. We looked at PubMed and Medline Science Direct, and then also we hand-searched the South African Journal of Clinical Nutrition because we were expecting to find um, some of the most relevant studies um, in that journal. Okay, and this was actually the, um, the studies in children. You can see here there were 25. Um, the light, is it the, the red one? Okay, and you can see here three studies in Limpopo, um, Pumalanga, no studies, Eastern Cape, no studies, and then one small study was done in Northern Cape, two in Western Cape, one small study in Free State, and one in Northwest. So in Choran, Mpumalanga and Eastern Cape, uh, nothing to report. And this, the other studies where there's only one study, generally there were small numbers and they were in one place, so they don't really um, represent the provinces as such. The age groups of children that were looked at were, you see there were nine studies in children that were younger than two, six studies in children three to five years, and then there were 10 studies done in the 19, uh, nine to five, 15 year old group. So, um, and as Lucia has mentioned earlier on, there were actually no studies in children younger than six months. Okay. This is a summary of the deficiencies of the studies in, study in children. And what was interesting about this was we went back and we looked at the National Food Consumption um, Survey to see what are the deficiencies reported in that study. And they're literally identical. Uh, there was um, energy, was one of the uh, big crises. In some, too much, and some too little. Calcium was probably the worst 
of, of all the nutrients, the macronutrients. Iron and zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B6, 12, B2, and vitamin C were the main um, nutrients that were deficient. What was quite interesting about the study was um, I happened to be at the MRC last week, and I asked the people that do the food composition data, who have the software that all the studies used, at what, in what year did they add the nutrients um, from, from fortification, because you know the fortification took, has taken place from, I think it was the end of 2004, um, maize meal and um, wheat flour have been fortified. And I, 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 I think I'm still in shock. It hasn't actually been added to the food composition tables. People are supposed to add it themselves. So I am, I am sort of wondering now, um, of these 25 studies, none have actually reported that they've added those nutrients, uh, which actually means going back to all the uh, primary investigators and asking them, did you actually add these nutrients? Is this why we see, still seeing the same problem? So, you know, it's just a, another motivation to do uh, another survey, if I can put it that way. Um, for example, if we look at protein, it's always a thing that comes up when we're looking at children. And um, interestingly enough, it's usually one of those macronutrients that is not deficient. You'll see in this study the RDA, which is the recommended dietary allowance for protein of 34 gram. In all the studies that we looked at, these were in 9 to 13 year old children. Um, most of them, you can see, were in Gauteng, had well, this one was borderline and this one was borderline, but they were all above the RDA. And the RDA is quite a strict um, um, measure of dietary intake. If we look at iron, which is also um, one of the um, micronutrients that we would be most worried about because of the effects of a deficiency of iron in children, we'll see that the, um, the ear, which is the estimated average requirement, is 5.9. And... Not too bad. He's one here, 5.3, and the others are all more or less above that, that value, um, which seems like an improvement if, if one goes back and looks at the values of the National Food Consumption Survey. But as I say now, I'm, I'm not sure um, iron is added with fortification. So did these studies actually add it, and is this why it's better, or is this something that one has got to investigate further? In terms of zinc, zinc affects growth, um, so it's also a very important micronutrient. You can see here that um, the estimated average is seven, and Free State did one study in a rural area, and Gauteng, uh, these two are very far below what is required. And I suspect, thinking back to the National Food Consumption Survey, zinc was serious problem also in most of the provinces. So I suspect that if one does a national study, this might still be something where, where there's um, uh, insufficient uh, zinc in the diet. Okay, in terms of calcium, you'll see here um, of 9 to 13 year olds, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually skip this one. Sorry. Calcium has a uh, requirement of one, over 1,000 milligrams a day for, um, for, for adults and for children. Very high values. So um, we looked, the average sort of values we found were between about 300 and 600. If one had 600, that was really high. So it's way, way below. There wasn't one study that actually had more than 50% of the calcium requirement. So the one um, nutrient that we know is very important and that is still deficient in the diet of, of children is calcium and it's not added in uh, with fortification. So um, one of the very important health promotion messages would be to encourage people to have more dairy. Of course, low-fat dairy uh, would be appropriate. Okay, in terms of studies in adults, um, it's, it's actually amazing to think that there, <laughs> there were only nine in 15 years. And you'll see all those zeros here, zero Eastern Cape, Northern Cape, uh, Limpopo, nothing, nothing was done there. Northwest had two big studies um, because of the university there. They do a lot of work on um, development and people urbanization, people in transition. So there's always quite a lot coming out of there. 
Mapuma Langa, nothing. Only one study in adults in Gauteng, two in Free State, and two in KwaZulu Natal. So, in terms of adults, it's really, really hard to make conclusions about their intake. Um, and this is, I think Lucia showed this as well. You can see here the, the lack of study here for the adults and also the same two provinces um, for the children. In terms of the adults, um, I've just given a summary here of, of some of the macronutrients. Um, there's a lot of information. It's quite a big report um, that, that came out of all of this. Um, it, it has been accepted for publication with uh, the journal Nutrients, and in fact we've proofread it, so it should be coming out within the next month. If anybody is interested, uh, you could go to Nutrients and you could um, find it on PubMed. Okay, in terms of studies with energy intakes less than the um, dietary recommended intakes, you'll see the, the, north, uh, the northwest province, um, African males and females had low intakes. Cape Town African males and females, these were in uh, Guguletu and Kailicha, and KwaZulu Natal, Indian males and in Indian females. These were small specific studies. They, weren't, they don't represent the province. Um, and usually researchers tend to look for the areas where they suspect the worst. So, as I said, it's not representative. Okay, and in terms of adults, you'll see um, the deficiencies that we found are virtually the same as for the children. And of course we expect that because they're living in the same house, they're eating the same food. So the, the nutrients are basically the same. Okay, in terms of food studies, um, I think um, maybe for industry this would be something really important that you'd want to know in terms of food, how much food is actually being eaten uh, in the different provinces, uh, in the urban areas, in the rural areas, in terms of portion sizes, particularly not only for marketing your products, but also in terms of if you are adding nutrients or anything else, you need to know how much are people actually having of that product. And you'll see it's uh, the 10 most commonly um, eaten products. And we go back to, sorry about that, we go back to maize meal, of course, comes in everywhere. Uh, sugar is either first or second, and then tea. Oh, it's not actually a food, but um, it comes up, so I've included it. And then you have the bread and milk is usually in all of them. Um, unfortunately, although milk always appears quite high up on the list of food commonly eaten, um, my experience with this has been that they're very small amounts. They're usually added to, to coffee or to tea. So, um, you know, children, for example, don't actually drink a cup of milk always what one would expect. They actually just have very small amounts. So it comes up because it's frequently consumed, but the amounts consumed are very small. Okay, and then there's the odd fruit or vegetables falls in here sometimes as well. Um, I could only find three studies where people actually presented data on foods and the actual intakes themselves. And as you can see, there are no portion sizes. So our conclusions from this study, or should I say this review, was that not all the provinces were covered. The sample sizes are small, they're not representative. And there's very little actual information on foods eaten and on their portion sizes. So it's very difficult to make decisions due to the actual scarcity of the data that's available. Okay. The next question that we need to ask ourselves, and also very important, unfortunately there is data in this regard, is how food secure are we actually? How food secure is South Africa? And we have quite a lot of data on this. Um, when one is looking at food security, there are four ways that you can do this. Um, the, these are the aspects of food security. Access to food, which is extremely important. Obviously, there has to be access. How the food is actually utilized, is it utilized by the body? And then also in terms of availability. It needs to be available, it needs to be accessible, and it needs to be utilized. And there are different ways to measure these different components. You'll see, for example, in order to measure access, there are two ways of doing it. You can either look at dietary diversity or you can look at hunger measures, the questionnaires, standardized questionnaires that actually measure that. In terms of utilization of food, you can look at 
um, anthropometric measurements and usually in children weight or height are measured and very frequently, sometimes more commonly now, BMI is also used with children and then of course BMI is very frequently used in adults. Um, dietary diversity, that is how widely distributed uh, food is in the diet, or how, uh, what the frequency is of eating different types of foods. Because of the um, theory that a, a very restricted diet, where you only have a few different food products in your diet, gives you a very limited access. So the, the bigger the variety in your diet, the better the chance is that you're going to cover all your essential uh, macro and micronutrients. Okay, and then there's also um, the issue oh boy, of um, food procurement. One can also look at food procurement. And in fact, in the National Food Consumption Study, they also looked at household uh, food inventory, what was actually in the cupboards. Okay, now in terms of South African studies, there have been four national studies that have looked at food security. There was the... Um, a national food consumption a study that I told you about in 1999. I've mentioned that a few times. Um, then there was a national food consumption study in 2005, but they didn't actually measure macro and micronutrients. They did, however, look at food security. The S South African Social Attitude Survey took place in 2009. It was done by the HSLC. It's, it's actually done annually. And then in, there was also the San Haynes that um, has been referred to, which was done in 2012. And there, once again, um, there's no data, quantified uh, dietary data, but there is information on food security. Okay, in terms of uh, food access, in terms of hunger measurements, what has been used in all the studies, which is really great, because if you use a different questionnaire every time, it's kind of hard to to uh, compare if there are different questionnaires used. And, and fortunately, um, each time they've used this, um, we call it the CHIP questionnaire, and it's, it was used over three times, and it measures household level food insecurity by asking questions like, does your household ever run out of money to buy food? Uh, do you ever rely on a limited number of foods to feed your children because you are running out of money to buy food for a meal. And usually these questions are asked in relation to the last month. Over the last month, did this happen? Over the last month, did that happen? And you'll see on the next one, it also measures individual level food insecurity. And the type of question asked there is more specific. Do you ever eat less than you should? Because there's not enough money for food. And very often the parent may eat less so that there's more for the child. So those are very re relevant then to individual level of security. And then there are specific questions on child hunger, such as asking the mother, do your children ever eat less than you feel they should because there's not enough money? Um, do they ever say they're hungry because there's not enough food in the house? Um, and do they go to bed because there is not enough money to, go, to buy food? So they're still hungry when they go to bed. So, um, so this tool is actually very useful because it can measure at the household, at the individual, and at, at the child level. Okay, and these are the results from that questionnaire um, because you can, there's a score and you can actually divide it up in terms of those experiencing hunger, at risk of hunger, and then those that are food secure based on the, the range um, from north to, I think, to, to about 30. And you'll see here, if you look at um, experiencing hunger, in 1999, it was 52. These are national studies, so we can compare this data. It was 52%, very high. If we look at the San Haynes that took place in 2012, it is 26%. So it has literally halved. Um, and when you look at some of the programs that have been implemented, such, such as, for example, uh, the school feeding schemes and a few other things like that, it kind of makes sense that um, there would be some improvement. And it's actually really nice to see um, that something is improving. If you look at at risk, that has stayed a little bit the same. It's gone up a bit here, but I think a lot of those people have actually moved out of this region into there. 
And food secure has gone up from 25% to 45%, almost 46%. So, um, so that is good news. Okay, if we look at this, um, I think it's just so nice to see the, the, the actual picture. Uh, what I've just told you now between the, the blue being the food secure, and you can see beautifully how, how it is actually in, uh, increased. And the hunger, um, greater than a score of five, has um, come right down from up there to down here. Okay, these are for um, the urban and the rural areas. And what we found in the past in national studies is that the rural areas, unfortunately, are, are always far worse off than the urban areas. And if we look at this, we can see here, if the food secure is the, the front one, the darker one, at risk is the next one, and then hunger is this lightest, lightest, lightest one. And you can see that this is um, the urban informal, this is in 2012, rural, and rural informal, and you, you can see the, the hunger is by far the highest still in these uh, rural informal areas. And urban informal, these are mostly informal settlements, and rural formal, still higher. Urban formal is much lower. Okay, in terms of um, the food insecurity, we, we can say that it is highest in rural informal areas, and at risk of high, hunger is highest in urban um, informal areas and lowest in urban formal areas. In terms of food access and uh, looking at dietary diversity, um, this has also been done in three national studies, so we have quite a good idea of the variety that people have in their diets. And the method that's used normally is a, a 24 hour recall which is not quantified. So it would, wouldn't be a case of trying to um, tease out portion sizes, which is very, very difficult to do and takes a long time to do. It's a case of just asking the person to tell you what they had to eat the day before and just recording all those items, not how much of anything. Um, the score is then determined um, from nine. Those items are divided into nine groups, like a dairy group, a meat group, and so on. And you'll see they here. And for each group eaten, there's a score of one. So the maximum, if you ate something from every group, you would have a score of nine, which would be fantastic. You would have a very, very diet because you would have eaten from all the food groups. Okay, and these are two studies um, which looked at, uh, we also call it food insecurity, which looked at diets that we had, were very, very poor in terms of variety. Those are diets where people had less than four groups. So they would have had out of three groups only or less. Um, and what it generally amounts to is that it's something from the starches, usually carbohydrates, obviously, um, maybe something from the meat group, and then usually something like fat. So that is a very, very poor quality diet and very low in variety. And if we look at the uh, SASA survey in 2008, actually 2009, and San Haynes 2012, we'll see here that diversity is uh, the, uh, this is in the SASA study, was around about, I can't see from here, I think it's 50%, had a score less than four, which is very poor. And this. 2012, not much better. Very close to that. Um, in terms of our uh, Afro-Euro um, mixed population, we have um, the San Haynes, San Haynes actually showed a higher value than the 2008 value. And the same in the Asian population, not a big difference though. The white population you see, they're under 10% in 2008 and it's risen a little bit to about 15% which have a poor diet, and then for South Africa as a whole, 50% do not have more than three food groups a day. That is the bottom line. Okay, in terms of the food groups that were the most deficient, vitamin A, rich fruit and vegetables, only 17% actually had one of those. 
In terms of uh, legumes and nuts, 18%. Eggs, which I was very surprised at. I thought that would be far higher. And 25% had some other fruit. So these, these were the items that, that really were the, the most, uh, very seldom appeared. Okay, um, I, we get asked all the time about which is the best uh, group, to, how do you, you know, group your groups? What do you decide? Do you have five groups? Do you have ten groups? When you divide up your information that you have, and different researchers have actually published different groups when they do this. Um, and some of the most common ones are six groups. Sorry. Um, six groups. We've always stuck with the nine groups. 13 groups, and some people have even used 21 groups. So we did a study to test the different groups on the same population to see whether the results would turn out differently. And we compared the dietary data with the NARs and the MARs, which MRR is just an average of all the nutrients. If you have an MAR of 100%, then you would be having 100% of all the most essential nutrients. Um, whereas this is for each nutrient on its own. If you had an NAR for iron of 67%, then it would be you were consuming 67% of the requirement, basically. And what we found was that it didn't really make a difference, uh, interesting enough. Um, we did correlations between, with the mean adequate ratio, and that, in other words, the quality of the diet with the different groups to see, um, you know, what it looked like. And you'll see it was, it, these correlations are very similar and they were all significant. So that kind of gave us the feeling that it's okay to carry on using nine, eight, uh, nine groups because it works very well with the type of diet um, that South Africans eat. I'm going to skip this. We just looked basically also at the sensitivity and the specificity of the diet. Um, this basically means sensitivity is how good the measure is of de detecting a deficiency or a poor diet. Um, I ideally want it as close as 100 to possible, as possible. And you see when you use a, um, a group of six, you get 98% here by three. If you look at nine, which we use, you get 97% around a cut of point at five, and so on. So they were very, very similar. So the message is it doesn't really matter which group you use. In terms of diversity then, uh, we can summarize and we can say that overall, the dietary diversity decreased in the black population between 2008 and 2012, but it increased very little in other groups. Between 40 and 50% of black South Africans have a very low dietary diversity score. In terms of food utilization, remember food utilization is showing how well the food is actually used by the body, utilized by the body. And we measure that in terms of stunting in children, in terms of stunting and wasting and underweight are normally the measures that we use. And you can see here the first column is the uh, 2005, the second one is the San Haynes of 2014. And there haven't really been very big changes, unfortunately, in those um, 10 years nearly. In fact, stunting went up a little bit. Uh, let me go to wasting, did come down, so did underweight. So there's a little bit of good news, but the stunting thing is not good because that means there's a deficiency in energy intake um, in a lot of areas. Stunting is the outcome of a, a chronic deficiency in energy intake. Um, the same story with the, those were the first one I showed you was one to three years. These are the four to six year olds. And you'll see here, the stunting has come down in the older children. The same with wasting and the same with underweight. So the older children have certainly have benefit, benefited by um, um, some of the programs that have been um, introduced. Okay, and these are children one to three years old. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. All right, in terms of food availability, uh, in terms of time and uh, other factors, to show you all that, I've just made a summary of what we know about how the, uh, and looking at the household inventory. And this is actually from the 1999 data. I don't have um, anything after that. 
Um, and we found that informal urban households and households with a higher income, at that stage it was greater than 12,000 rand, they had more food items in the household in inventory, an average of nearly 16 different uh, food items in the inventory, than the rural households and the households with a low income, at that stage less than 12,000 rand, where it averaged 7.4 different food items. Now, we, this is not condiments and things like that. It's actual food. So if you think about it, and you think of your own house, and you think about what's in your cupboard, then I'm sure um, it's, it's quite shocking, actually. OK, in terms of the anthropometry, um, to uh, summarize that, uh, stunting, severe stunting has increased from 2005 to 2012 in one to three year olds, and wasting has decreased in the one to three year old group. In the four to six year olds, uh, stunting, wasting, and underweight have decreased. Okay. If we look at food availability, it also differed across the provinces. Um, in all provinces except for the Western Cape, Food variety was lower in the poorer, poorer and rural households than in the higher income and urban households. And we found an average of five versus 14 food items, respectively. So it's a different way of looking at it, but you, you basically get very similar results. And the Western Cape has recorded the greatest food variety. They had an average of 15 food items compared with the rest of the country. Okay. I think that was the last one. Okay, just in conclusion then, food security then in terms of access to food has improved over the last decade, although it's still high in the rural areas. In terms of dietary diversity, it has increased in the black population since 2008, but not sufficiently, I feel. And food security in terms of utilization has increased with regard to stunting, but it has decreased with regard to underweight since 2005. And I think that's the last one. Thank you.